but you've probably already read it. Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Just another struggling writer. The beleaguered author's one-stop shop for commiseration and hopefully inspiration. My name is Carrie Cher and I am just another struggling writer. Today I am bringing you the book recommendations tag. 14 questions to hopefully help you find your next favorite read. Starting with... For me, this is easy. It's Pride and Prejudice. And I don't just tell everyone it's my favorite. It is my favorite. It's a classic. I don't need to explain the plot to you. It's just my cozy comfort read. And no matter how many times I read it, the plot twists and turns and the revelations and the yearning, it all hits exactly the same as it did the first time. I know that's not the most exciting answer, but it's mine. Question two. Now, I don't really believe in guilty pleasures. You should just own what you like. As long as it's not hurting anybody, I think it's totally fine. You don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed of it. But if I had to pick one, I would say Queen of the Tearling by Erica Johansson. This is a epic, ish f political fantasy about a young woman whose crown was usurped when she was a small child. Her family was killed and she had been squirreled away, hidden uh, until the time was right for her to retake her kingdom. And when that time comes, she is taken out from her foster family and taken back to the capital where the kingdom has basically been enthralled, not quite enslaved, but pretty much to this neighboring kingdom who basically demands a shipment of slaves every month or so. And she, when she arrives, it is her first order of business to put a stop to that, which inflames tensions between their country and their neighbor and basically puts them at the precipice of war. I will admit that at the time that I read it, I gave it 3.5 stars, but I think of it very fondly, even though there are some elements of this that if I read it today, I probably wouldn't be a fan of. Like the main girl's name is Kelsey, but it's spelled K-E-L-S-E-A, like C. And I thought that was just one of the lamest names for a, a, you know, a returning queen. And she's got this weird romance with a side character that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And there are some elements where it taps back into the real world. Like this is supposed to be a world that started in the real world and then traveled to this place. And that's where, you know, that's ancient history for them. That felt a little weird and out of place too. But I just think of my experience reading this book very, very fondly. I think it just came to me at the right time and I really enjoyed it. Next up. I'm gonna go a little bit controversial here with Six of Crows. You've probably read or at least heard about Six of Crows. It is a gritty kind of fantasy heist story uh, with some found family and, you know, a little bit of romance and this ragtag crew of children who are hyper competent at everything that they do and pull off this crazy heist. And I, I wasn't a fan for two reasons. I wasn't a fan of their age. I felt that they were cosmetic. Even though the writing matched their ages, this definitely reads like a YA. I just, if you want to write about adults, write about adults. You don't need to make them children. I didn't really care for the fact that Kaz Brecker, the main character, is 17 and yet he has risen through the ranks to be this feared, not quite a crime boss, but ultimate kind of a crime boss and all of his crew are also children. They're also underage. I just didn't buy it. It didn't feel believable. And like, it would have felt believable if this was sort of like the whole world was like this, but no, it's just this crew, this crew of hyper competent children. And like I said, I, I just didn't believe it. It made, it really took me out of the story. Even though the writing did feel YA, the ages didn't match the story that was being told. That bothered me. And then I also wasn't really a fan of the way that Lee Bardugo wove in the backstory. It really like felt like the momentum of the plot was being halted just so we could learn about backstory. And I also just didn't really care about the romance that much. I'm sorry, no matter what happens later, you can't tell me that the first 
thought that we get from the guy's perspective is he wants to literally choke the life out of his love interest. Not a fan, no matter what comes later. It was good, it was fine. I gave it three stars, but I did not get on the hype train as everyone else. And it does make me feel a little bit like an outsider in the fantasy community. But if YA is your jam, if gritty stories with magic and the underbelly of society and a heist, which isn't really a heist, that's kind of a misnomer, but we'll leave it at that. It might be for you. You've probably already read it though. Next up. And that for me would be Sword Heart. I read it in a single day. This is a fantasy romance about a woman who has abruptly come into some money that she didn't expect. And the family of the man who willed her this money is basically trying to get it from her by way of marriage. They want to force her into marrying one of the cousins so that they can have access to that money that she inherited. In an effort to get out of this marriage, she decides to kill herself. And in doing so, she draws a sword that has a magic man inside. That man then swears to protect her from those who are threatening her. And then they go on this journey together to basically acquire a lawyer to ensure that she will actually get her owed inheritance. This book is set in the world of the white rat. It's the same world with uh, T. King Fisher's Paladin series and the Clockwork Boys. So there's a little bit of familiarity there if you've read those, but really this one to me has been the best so far. It has a really great romance, really, really, really charming and sweet with really fun characters and just like kind of a cozy quest story that also has some darker elements to it. So for me, Sword Heart is one of the perfect standalones and one of the perfect fantasy romances out there. Next up, For me, this is always going to be Red Sister by Mark Lawrence. This was my favorite book of the like the last five years that I've read. If I had to sell you on this book, what I would tell you is that it is a gritty, dark fantasy about nun assassins in a fascinating science fantasy world with an almost exclusively female cast. But really, this is a book about friendship. In this book, we follow Nona, who is a young girl who through a series of circumstances ends up at the convent, the Sisters of Sweet Mercy, is that it? Who train their charges in the ways of the magic of this world, as well as poisoning and swordplay and assassination. It's gritty, it's dark, but it's also very beautiful. And Mark Lawrence's writing is very poignant and has a lot to say that you wouldn't expect in this story about nun assassins. But when I tell you this story changed my brain chemistry, I'm not joking around. I think back on some of the lines in this book all the time as ways to get myself out of a mental slump. For me, this has a very special place in my heart and I see almost no one talking about it. Yes, it came out like something like five or six years ago, but even, even when I go back that far, I don't see this, this series talked about that much and I wish more people would read it. Next up. I looked up a list of a bunch of books that were becoming on screen media. And I'll be honest, I hadn't read any of them. So I then thought, what about a book that you'd like to see become a TV show or movie? And for that, I went with The Adventures of Amina Al-Sarafi by Shannon Chakraborty. And this was one of my favorite books that I read last year. It is about a pirate queen who has gone on to retire in the countryside with her family when she receives an offer from a wealthy woman that Amina basically can't refuse. It is for an obscene sum of money for what is essentially a rescue job. So she decides to get the band back together and go on this quest. But of course they find out that there is more than meets the eye to not just the woman who's hired them, but the girl they are meant to rescue as well. I love that this book features an older female main character. I love that it is kind of a nautical story. I love that it's in, based in the Middle East. and. I just love the group of people that Amina has around her. This was such a fun story, a fun little nautical fantasy romp. And I am so looking forward to the rest of them. I think you could probably tell a hundred of these stories and it would make a great TV show. Next up. 
I tried not to repeat any answers, but for this one, I would be lying if I didn't say it was Pride and Prejudice again. I do reread this book at least once a year. It's actually closer to once every nine months or so. Like I said, it's just a comfort cozy read for me. And whenever I'm feeling like I'm slumping or I just want something familiar, not looking for anything new, I do my reread of it. So I've probably read it 20 times and I don't see that ever being eclipsed by any other book. Next up, For this, I chose The Last Tale of the Flower Bride by Roshini Chokshi. You might say, Carrie, why did you include this one for this category? And I will tell you, my biggest issue with this book when I read it the first time was that it was advertised as fantasy and it is not fantasy. If you are expecting fantasy, you're not getting that. And for me, I think I would have enjoyed it way more if I wasn't turning every page and waiting for the fantasy elements to appear. They don't. It is sort of a contemporary, kind of gothic, kind of mystery, kind of thrillery story about these two girls and their friendship and how things fell apart. And the writing does feel very lyrical and fairy tale esque, but there are no fantasy elements. If you go in expecting fantasy, it might disappoint you like it did me. And I really don't want anyone to have the same experience I did because I think this is a good book. But when I read it the first time, I was so frustrated. I gave it only three stars because I felt lied to. So I will recommend this book. It is very beautiful and it does tell a good story. It's just not a fantasy. Next up. For me, that is God Killer by Hannah Kaner. I had talked about this probably a dozen times already, so I won't go into the whole spiel of why I think it deserves the hype, but Basically, the story is about a woman who is what is known as a god killer. In this world, gods are beings that have been summoned by prayer and offering. And at one time, the worship of gods was the norm. They were widespread and they were very powerful until a war broke out among the gods that ultimately claimed the lives of so many mortals that the tide of popular opinion turned against them. However, it is now getting back to the point where worship of gods is desired again by some members of the population and that has caused friction with the kingdom. As I said, our main character is a hunter of these gods. Anytime one gets too powerful and starts causing trouble, she is called in to destroy them. I said it before, I'll say it again. The best part of the book about, about this book for me was how concise it was and how much of a punch it packed in so few pages. The paperback version of this book is only 288 pages and yet it tells a full epic fantasy story with four POV characters that get complete narrative arcs. That is really goddamn impressive. Next up. And I struggled a little bit with this one, but ultimately I decided The Stardust Thief by Chelsea Abdullah because I just love the relationship between our main character Luli and her Jin bodyguard Kadir. It's not quite paternal and it's definitely not romantic, but they are, it's almost like platonic soulmates. They truly, truly love each other. They truly, truly have this incredible bond that is tested and stretched and nearly broken throughout the course of this story. I also love the prince character Mazen. I love that he was flawed and yet just so lovable at the same time. And our third POV character, Aisha, she was also really compelling. And her story arc had just such a twist right in the middle that it just really sold the whole thing for me. In this book, we follow Luli, who is a merchant of magical wares. She and her gin bodyguard hunt down these items and then sell them on the black market. One day she is caught by the king and actually tasked with finding this mysterious object that has the power of destruction destroying all gin. She doesn't want this. Obviously, she's very close with her own gin, but she basically has no choice. And she goes on this quest with one of the prince's sons and one of the prince's 40 thieves. And together they find out so much more about the kingdom and the gin and the world itself. A lot of people compared this to City of Brass and I see the comparisons. It's set in the Middle East with a prominent gin character and there's a lot of lore that is similar or shared. I actually preferred this one at the time that I read it. I think there, I, I now think that there, it, the comparison isn't necessarily fair as they're to telling two totally different stories. This one definitely was more fun for me to read. Next up, 
That one was hard for me because I read a lot of epic fantasy where it's not really ideal conditions for a person to want to live in if you don't have magical powers or if you're not the chosen one. So I went with Lord of Stariel, which is a cozy fantasy romance that is just sort of Edwardian England with some fairies and some magic. And that's really the craziest things get. This book, it was another one that just came to me at the right time. It was exactly what I needed, something cozy and low stakes and just fun and not too, it didn't lean too far into the fairy romance part, which I really enjoy considering everything else. So if I had to live in a fantasy, this would be the style of fantasy story I'd want to live in. Next up. For me, that would be Fevered Star by Rebecca Roanhorse, the second of her Between Earth and Sky trilogy, the first of which being Black Sun. I am not shy about the fact that I did not really care for certain elements of Black Sun, particularly two of the POV characters, and I, the fact that I didn't find the ending very surprising at all. In fact, I felt thought it was telegraphed pretty much from the very beginning. And the way that it ended, while again, I kind of saw it coming, I didn't really love that much either. And so when I first finished it, I decided I wasn't gonna continue because I just wasn't excited about the sequel. Then I thought about it some more and I realized that's kind of a petty reason. I really did, I like the writing and the setting and some of the characters. So I decided to give Fevered Star a shot and through three quarters of this book, it was definitely a sophomore slump. Elements that I feared I wouldn't like were still there and were still prominent. And it was kind of boring. Definitely is setting up for the third book in the trilogy, but the ending sold it completely. Changed my mind about the, the previous 300 pages that I had read and the ending of the first book. So for me, I went into this thinking this was probably going to be at best a three star, maybe even lower than that. And for a lot of it, it was, but the way that things ended really completely changed my mind about everything else that I had read. I ended up giving it four stars. Obviously I can't talk too much about this plot because of spoilers. And I do think that it suffered a little bit of sophomore slumpiness, but it definitely set up the third book in a way that I am so excited for. Next up. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not a big crier. I can compartmentalize pretty good when I'm reading. However, in The Assassin's Apprentice, the version that I had originally read had certain illustrations in it. And at the very end, there was one illustration with the main character and his dog. And oh my God, the floodgates opened. It was just so touching for me. Of course, Assassin's Apprentice is a classic. If you haven't read it, it might be for you. This is, it's kind of divisive because it's a little bit slower. It's more character driven about a young boy who is the bastard son of the king in waiting. And to basically take care of any inheritance issues, he is uh, apprenticed to the royal assassin. He's raised in the castle a part, a uh, uh, separate from the royal family, but kind of, you know, aware of them. And this is really just about him growing up and learning his trade and learning his place in the world. Again, I know it might not be for everybody, but it definitely was for me. I loved everything about this book. At the time that I read it, I remember thinking this is the kind of story I want to tell, something political, something with fantasy elements that aren't too like overpowering, that is largely character driven. I've moved on from that idea, but this still really inspired a lot of my writing when I first read it. And lastly, For me, there is no other answer but The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. I've talked about this before, but reading The Fifth Season the first time for me was a visceral, emotional, almost difficult to get through experience. I was uncomfortable. I was like very anxious. I like almost dreaded picking it up at times. And yet when I closed the book, when I finished it, I thought that I could not conceive of a more perfect book. I loved everything about it from the plot, the characters, the writing style, the themes, everything about it. Again, and I still think this, I cannot conceive of a more perfect book than the fifth season. And even though it was difficult at times to get through, I would give anything to go back and experience that pull, that dread, that gnawing feeling in the pit of my stomach that I 
I'm afraid of what's going to happen next, but I need to know. If you haven't read Fifth Season, please do. And that is everything. I know I'm not as widely read as a lot of people on here, but these are some of my favorites over the last couple of years as I've gotten back into reading. Which one of these books is your favorite and which one haven't you read before? Let me know in the comments. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, please consider liking and subscribing. It is so appreciated. I am still just a baby channel and every new subscriber and every new view on my video is seen and deeply appreciated. So that's it for me. I will see you in my next video. Bye.